had to choose a mascot for your company or organization or group or family or even yourself, what would it be? Welcome to What Is It About the Weather podcast, where we explore the many ways that weather intertwines itself into our lives. I'm your host, Mark Jelanek. And this week, we're going to be talking about weather mascots, I guess. But before we get to that, as always, I hope you're having a good weather week. Something enjoyable, something maybe a little different, something noteworthy. But in short, something that you know keeps you interested in the weather, whatever that might be. Big heat wave going on in India. Been hearing a lot about it in the news the last week, but it's really been going on. It, for those that don't know, India, where it sits, gets heat every year. Usually it's more of a May problem than a March and April problem, which it has been this year. But ultimately what happens is the monsoon, monsoon season kicks in and you get the rains that it's not magically make the heat go away, but it does kind of shift the setup and you know temper things down a little bit. And it's some of the, it's the same actually change of weather patterns that makes it impossible to climb Mount Everest in the summertime, right? So you get this window on Mount Everest that goes from being just too cold wintry to being tolerable, I guess, if you will. And it's that same flow. So in case you've never made that connection, you know, you've got this massive mountain range that kind of separates India and the rest of, of Asia, particularly China or, or areas of, of um, kind of interior South Asia, if you will. Any case, that's been going on. It, it's, you know, we've talked about heat before, and it's just a reminder again, again, that the biggest weather killer is not the cyclones you hear about typically. I mean, it really isn't, you know, year in, year out, even though you can have these massive cyclonic events particularly tropical cyclones, and it's not the tornadoes. All those make news, right? They're, flashy is the wrong word to use, but they're uh, acute versus chronic, if you will, and heat's more of a chronic thing, and this is just another example of that. And it's unfortunate, and I, I saw that in the last day or two that I, the worst of it seems to have eased a little bit, but it might come back. Again, they're used to it more now that we're in May. Um, but they had hottest March and April on record in the last, I guess, 122 years since they've been keeping records. But to India, I hope you guys can survive a little longer and hope the monsoons come with a reasonable amount of rain. It's, it's a, a contrast of things, right? My weather, you know, I, I wish you all to have good weather. My weather, I guess, finally got interesting today, this week. It, it has been kind of, I'd almost call it non-distracting weather. Has it been anything that's drawn me to the window to look out and spent a lot of time looking outside? Yeah, a couple of cloud shots this week that, you know, it's like, oh, that's an interesting formation. Uh, but for the most part, it's kind of been, you know, some sun, most of clouds, a little bit of rain here and there. Today was a nice rain, though. It was, it was substantial enough where I got out and actually took a walk in the rain. Yes, I do that without an umbrella and get wet and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I have a hat on or whatever, but I enjoy that. Again, it gets into feeling the weather, if you will. And I always enjoy having that opportunity. But, you know, generally speaking, kind of a bland week, which is probably pretty good with me getting over this cold. You know, I'm still kind of, and maybe you could still hear it in my voice a little. Overall, I, I really do think I'm better now. But, yeah, a little cough here and there. But thankfully, uh, I, I think I'm over whatever the worst part of it was. And... You know, maybe I can get back to enjoying spring and do some outdoorsy things. All right, let's talk about weather mascots. Or at least the idea of weather mascots. And I'm going to say to you, you know, I talked about even in my opening statement about the idea of mascots. And I am curious, and, and I'll go ahead and kind of throw out the contact information. I want you to think about it as we're talking about it. But I'd, I'd be curious to hear stories about any sort of connection you have to mascots, either one that means a lot to you or one that you've been involved in choosing. 
But what is it about the weather at gmail.com or you can hit me up, Mark underscore Jelonic on Twitter. And certainly uh, what is it about the weather on Twitter? Just let me know if, if you have any or as we talk about the story, if there's something comes to mind, as always, you can get hold of me those ways. All right, mascots. They haven't been around forever. I mean, I, you know, you could probably find some movie that makes it seems like we've had mascots for thousands of years, but they're they're a relatively young thing. I, yeah, I couldn't find a definitive answer on this, but, you know, let's say in the last 100, 150 years. And sports seems to be the primary place where they kind of grabbed hold. But it's not the only place by any means. And every time you kind of read a story and you can Google about mascots or that sort of thing, you don't need me to put a link in the show notes or anything. You can figure that out in your own. You will often get the sports piece, but they also talk about branding. And a lot of companies, as an example, have been very successful with using mascots. It's like the uh, Geico Gecko or uh, the new one, Liberty Mutual, and their EMU, or there's, I, I forget what the insurance company is, that's doing like the anti mascot where they show all the other mascots, which to me is still using mascots. And I didn't remember their name, so maybe they should use a mascot. But they, I guess they allow you to grab hold, right? They allow you to take an idea or a team or, again, an organization, and it allows you to, you know, have a a quick representation and a quick identity that makes it easy to remember or follow. It's like it's like Yogi the Bear and and Jellystone Park and, you know, that or Woodsy, help Woodsy spread the word, never be a dirty bird sort of thing. You know, it can lock you into a campaign. It can trigger memories, but it kind of keeps you connected, right? And so that's probably why sports teams have used them because, you know, if you don't want to talk about the um I don't know, the Chicago football team, you know, and call it that way. It just seems like a lot of trouble or or college team or anything like that. Going to have to repeat everything, it gets to be a lot of effort. So having mascots or even having team names for that matter, whether it was specifically a mascot or not, allowed you to quickly identify, you know, have a shortened abbreviation and created kind of an identity. You could root around it and it could be recognizable wherever you are. Like this year, you know, I, we're, it's kind of funny. I'll, you're going to hear mascots and, and their connection to me, but I have degrees from two schools in the state of Georgia here in the U.S. And one of them is University of Georgia. It's where I got my undergraduate degree. And they won the national football championship this year. And I got a new uh, you know, was somebody bought me as a gift, a hoodie that had George on it. And I was, I don't remember where I was, but it was, um, kind of in, out, I don't, you know, New York somewhere. And I, actually that's where it was. And somebody starts up a conversation with me at lunch. It's like, Oh, did you go to school there? And I see yeah, oh, my sister-in-law did too. And, you know, it, it just, it, it brings a connection to a situation. It's kind of like talking about the weather, right? It, it, it's another one of those things that it, breaks down barriers or it makes it easier to have a a launching pad into a conversation that may not exist otherwise. So they serve a lot of purposes and they've been around a long time, but I started looking about what's the connection to weather or, you know, how much of it do we have? And, And really this, you know, I was doing some digging on this and we'll get to some of the kind of popular ones and the connection with weather. But what started initially as this broad investigation really had this kind of twisted around me sort of connection. And I'll tell you what that is. So one of the things when I was a kid, I got thrown a trivia question and it was, can you name all the college teams that have a team name that doesn't end in S? And you know, you might think of like the fighting Irish of Notre Dame. So a lot of them are plurals that don't have an S in the plural, right? And there are others, and there are the Tulane Green Wave, right, is an example of that. But there was one that, that I didn't know about in at that point in time. But there were, you know, somebody said there was like 10. Actually, you know, and this was talking like U.S. of a certain level sort of colleges. And there was one that, I was unfamiliar with just because it was a school I didn't know. It was the University of Tulsa. 
And their team name is the Golden Hurricane, right? And it was a change from the Golden Tornadoes. And this this is what I found out, right? I was looking at it. I was reminded about this team name when I was looking into this. And so I did a little research. And I'm going to put a link in the show notes because it's an interesting story. So it goes back all the way to 1922. So 100 years ago, this team had changed their colors. They used to have orange. And I, I don't know if it was orange and black, but they had switched to yellow and black. And they had a new coach, and he wanted a new identity. And they were kind of being called the Yellow Jackets. But realistically, he had thrown out maybe this this golden tornado, and they liked that idea. But then they heard that Georgia Tech, school number two that I got a degree from, the one that has me doing this podcast theoretically today, was using the name Golden Tornadoes. But what's Particularly interesting in that is, as many people maybe know today, Georgia Tech is known as the Yellow Jackets, so it's interesting that this Tulsa team also was using that name. I I don't know. It was sort of weird. So here I have this weather connection between this school I'd never heard of and my alma mater and these mascot names. So it kind of got me digging deeper. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, huh, the more I I dug into it, kind of the more interesting. But I digress. Let's get off my personal story for a moment and get on to the idea that in recent years, and this didn't used to be the case, professional sports teams a lot of times were animal names or things like that, or even like the Chicago White Sox or the Boston Red Sox. You know, it was like a color thing or the Cleveland Browns. And I know it's not very exciting. You know, there was reasons to call that. Or, you know, they used to have, it's like the Pittsburgh Steelers that identified with the region. But in recent times, weather names have become pretty popular, not just with college teams that have used them for a while, but also with professional teams. And so you have things like the Colorado Avalanche or the Miami Heat or the Oklahoma City Thunder or the Tampa Bay Lightning. And then I saw one for the um, women's NBA, the WNBA, that was the Seattle Storm. And I was struck by their logo that had a lightning bolt in it. And, you know, I was reminded, why do you have a lightning bolt in your logo? Because thunderstorms are really unusual in Seattle. Yes, it rains a lot. And so I'm not sure that the name really fits, but I digress. And then there's teams that use the same one, like Miami and Carolina, both. So one's college team, one's professional team, used hurricanes, right? And those are, that's actually, for Miami, that's probably the most iconic weather related name, just because Miami's been a big sports school for many years. And so there's a whole, there's been this history. And like I said, it continues to grow and it, it, it seems very popular right now. Right, and, and you can imagine think names like thunder or storm or lightning, they they invoke a representation of power and strength, if you will. Now, I I always worry about that on the flip side, but you know Miami suffered from tremendous hurricanes in the past, so I think there can be a negative connotation with it as well. But I, I get the gist of why it happens, and then you have this thing that those a lot of cases are team names. And it's more the team identity. But you know, sometimes you have a mascot that's also associated with a team that doesn't have – it's like the Auburn Tigers are – they have a war eagle. And, and you know, you, you do – I see these things where there's kind of two things. But sometimes it's like, well, one of my alma maters, George Bulldogs, right? And they have Ugga, who is a bulldog, right? So at least it's that connection. But they're also – individual mascots themselves that have these weather names and I think they're they're kind of cool in that regard so there's Stormy the Cyclone so this was a I think a minor league baseball team that had that actually it's a pretty cool little logo the bat was a kind of the nose but the cyclone was like a tour it was more of a tornado I think this was I don't remember somewhere in the midwest that deals with tornadoes is a minor league baseball team, I think. And then you had the, the one that caught my eye that was really funny was Sonny the Sunbird, right? And it was like out in Fresno, California or something, but you know, it was a real stretch. So just imagine Sonny the Sunbird at some place that's always sunny. And, you know, it's a little weak, but I get the gist of what they were doing. But I kind of like the ones where you have weather in the name, but it was more truly of a representation or, or it invokes something. Like there was the Omaha Storm Chasers, right? You, you can imagine that. 
or there's the martial thundering herd and that you know was a representation of buffalo and the noise it made but it, it, it gave you this visual so it, again it, it's these weather components twist around and play that but let's get to the gist of all this right the real question is is does weather have a mascot okay is there something about weather is there something mascot related well i brought up one of these before and weather seems to have a connection with insects okay and there are a couple but probably the most famous and well-known is the butterfly and you've probably heard the phrase butterfly effect before if not in this podcast it's somewhere and it and it ties to the idea of chaos theory and really it comes from an experiment that a, a famous scientist in the field of meteorology Lorenz had a model that if you will imagine two points and sometimes it maybe think about it as you could think about it as two suns in a you know in space right and they have a planet that's orbiting around those two suns and it, what it's called is the strange attractor so you got this gravity field if you will but it can exist in it's things that happen in fluid dynamics and other things associated with weather which is what he was exploring but the idea is, depending on where you started your little initial flow around these two orbiting points, if you will, these two center points, it created, based on the flow, something that ultimately filled out, even though it, it contained itself, it never kind of went away, it continued to flow and go around these things, it changed enough each time to where it created this thing that looked like a butterfly pattern, it looked like two wings of a butterfly. Right. And that it's called the strange attractor problem, but it is the idea of chaos theory, which again has been made famous in movies like Jurassic Park and other places. But the idea is pretty simple that what was being explored was the concept that if you change the initial conditions ever so slightly, ever so slightly, you can end up with a very different income, the income, very different outcome. Income would be good too. So, if you you know move it a little to the left, a little right, a little warmer, a little colder, a little stronger pressure, a little weaker pressure, and you've heard me talk about this idea before, but it's one of the things that can cause errors in forecast, and one of the reasons weather forecasts are generally constrained to a certain period of time, at least with a certain type of modeling process. But what's also interesting is that same scientist in 1972, I think, did a... a was giving a speech and he talked about a butterfly in Brazil. I think he, I mean, he knew the idea of what he was doing and that strange attractor had probably already garnered the idea of butterfly was a butterfly flapping, flapping its wings in Brazil could give you a tornado in Texas. And again, he was trying to convey the same idea, which is something very small, a very small change could lead to a very big outcome somewhere else. Now let's be clear, a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil is not going to give you a tornado in Texas, but the thought process is very similar, which is little changes continue to happen, continue to happen, continue to happen to where something becomes no longer recognizable or it becomes flushed out, if you will. And that's what happens when you change initial conditions. And you've heard me mention it when I talk about different things about modeling and let's say resolutions in a model and the equations that represent weather and how they're simplified because of how much computing power they take or how much even we understand and, you know, different scales and those sort of things. But his was very focused on the initial condition idea, which is if you take this same process for taking this initial information, whether it's, you know, you have a grid of a certain size and these set of equations, you're going to get very different outcomes each time just by making little small perturbations in those initial values. So that's the one that's well known, but I came across another one recently in doing some work that is another insect and it's called the hawk moth. Okay. And I don't know if you've ever seen this insect, but it's got wings that kind of have a a two-tier system is the best way I know to describe it. So it's got an initial wing and then it kind of narrows in and it's got a second one. And it's a very distinctive looking insect. 
So I've got some links in the show notes. You can kind of look at that up. But you can again, you can just Google hawk moth, and you'll see what it, what it is I'm talking about. And the idea here, it's kind of like what I was talking about with Lorenz, but it's a little different in. Instead of changing the initial conditions, what it's basically saying is if I have two approaches to modeling whatever it is, and this can be anything, if I'm modeling um, you know, stock behavior or economics or uh, you know, whatever you're going to be looking at, modeling how a pathogen is going to work right, and how it's going to flow. And the, again, we've just dealt with this with COVID, and you have different models telling you different things. Basically what it's saying is, if I give them all the exact same initial conditions, the way they represent that scientific process or that process in general, let's say they use a slightly different set of equations to represent the same fundamental idea or, again, have some different structure to it that as you take those same initial conditions, because the models are different, even though they're trying to portray the same thing, over time, they're going to have this, again, they're going to have these ebb and flow states, but they're going to end up on very different outcome paths. So they may only still have a constrained set of outcomes, but the two sets of outcomes could end up being drastically different, or if you will, out the ends of the wings on, the, on this moth type creature, even though fundamentally they're still part of that same creature, this same basic system. And it's just showing a different way of the challenges of forecasting models. It was an interesting thing, something I'd not heard about before. But we get back to the same premise, which is modeling, whether it's weather modeling or anything else, could be very difficult to do. Okay, And these are some of the challenges that come up. I find it interesting that weather has ended up with insects as their mascots. But as I said earlier, if you've been involved in mascots, just, you know, some way, interesting story to share, please do. What is about the weather at gmail.com? Mark underscore Jelonic on Twitter or what is about the weather on Twitter. Look forward to hearing from you. But in the meantime, the next time you see an emu running on the television screen, just remember, there's much more to weather than the weather itself.